Hello, and welcome to Take a Look Tacoma. I'm your host, Marlon Howard. Constructed in 1927, it has housed a restaurant, a speakeasy, and a drive through In 1955, what was once the Coffee Pot Restaurant became the Java Jive, and a Tacoma landmark was cemented. It has been featured in several films, and at one time, the house band was world-famous rock combo, The Ventures. This sort of history is scattered all over Tacoma. Let's take a look. First of all, could you tell me um, the, a little history about the Grand Cinema and, and your position and what do you do sure. here? Sure. The, the Grand has been around as a nonprofit cinema since 1997. Uh, the, some people tried to work it as a for profit cinema for a couple of years and it wasn't working. And luckily, a lot of great volunteers stepped up to save the Grand and, and get it to what it is today. Um, we, we have about 137,000 people who came to movies here last year. Um, I've been here about six and a half years. I'm Philip Cowan, Executive Director of Tacoma's Grand Cinema. What makes the Grand Cinema different than any other theater in the area? Well, I, th I think that we're primarily focused on the, the quality of the films that we bring in rather than trying to bring in big Hollywood films. We're, we're trying to bring in films that, are, that you don't often get a chance to see other places that you're not going to see in a mainstream theater. We play foreign films, we play documentaries, we play anything in the U.S. It could be a drama or a comedy. Um, it, it's just the, whatever's quality out there, we try to get to the people. What's the process in choosing? Well, that, that's the fun part of my job. I do a lot of research. I go to some film festivals. I go to Sundance every year and a few other things throughout the year. I have a choice between film A and film B. Film B might draw more people, but the film's not very good. Okay. But whereas film A is just a high quality film and everybody who comes to see this film is gonna love it and we're gonna go with that strong film. So for profit, is you're, you're essentially out to make as much money as possible. We're, you know, we need to make enough money to, to keep the doors open and everything, but we can look at things based on kind of their artistic merit rather than the dollars generated by them. Now, when you do uh, show the films, what's the normal time span of showing it? Well, a, a movie week is you know Friday through Thursday, so always at least the one week typically. We've had films stay up here as long as four months. The, throughout the history of film, everybody's shown 30 prints in 35 millimeters. It's kind of like if you think of your your camera use, everybody used to use 35 millimeter cameras and now everybody uses digital cameras and the, the same thing is happening with film. Um, so we're in the process of fundraising to, okay. to change that. The, the industry has decided we're not going to be making 35 millimeter prints anymore so for us to stay in business as a movie theater we need to change to digital so we're in the process of doing a big $350,000 fundraising campaign right now. We host the Tacoma Film Festival each October. Um, we're entering into our seventh year of that this year. Um, and in that one, we, that's one where filmmakers do submit films to us. 
Um, they'll, they'll come from around the globe and we'll take a look at those and then pick out the best ones of those. And then we also invite some films in uh, from some smaller distributors or things that maybe haven't come out yet and we'll get a chance to have people have, see a sneak peek for that. What about the, uh, the 72 hour uh, film festival? Can you tell me a little the process or how it all works? Sure, we, we do a lot of fil different film events and 72 hour film competition is one of them. It's strictly for local filmmakers. Um, we have 30 teams that uh, come to the Grand they, they come on a Thursday night and I give them four criteria that they use for a film, uh, like a line of dialogue or a prop, like we've had a fortune cookie as a prop, or, uh, or a different a bridge in Tacoma or something like that. So then they, they take those common criteria and they have 72 hours to go home and make a film. And it's really a good chance for us to promote local filmmaking, so we're doing a little bit beyond just the typical mainstream theater, what they would be doing. What is the mission of the Grand Cinema? We're, we're promoting the art of film. Uh, and, and trying to get people to see things that they wouldn't have otherwise, and, and education, and just all things related to film, to get them to appreciate it in ways that we may, maybe haven't thought about before. Okay. All right, again, thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Sure, it's great talking to you. Okay, thank you. Take a look, Tacoma. Take a look, Tacoma. I'm here today on top of the Murray Morgan Bridge, and I'm gonna talk with Tom Rutherford. So come on, let's check it out. bridge was built in 1895. It was a swing bridge and it was built to really provide a link between where people lived in, uh, in downtown Tacoma and all the jobs in the port. Uh, there were some problems with that bridge. It wasn't very efficient for the shipping. 
So in 1913, they replaced it with this vertical lift bridge. My name is Tom Rutherford. I'm the project manager for the City of Tacoma Public Works Department for the Murray Morgan Bridge Rehabilitation. The vertical lift bridge, uh, they were sort of the, in vogue at the turn of the century. They're very easy to construct. They're very easy to operate. Uh, they're not that complicated of a bridge. We don't have that many lifts per year here, so because we are 60 foot above the water, at, at uh, low tide, so most ships can get underneath. And we really only have about uh, 10 openings a month. Uh, and most of those are during the summer, during the peak uh, sailing season. The state wanted to tear the bridge down after the new 509 was put in, but there was a group called Save Our Bridge. Uh, they like to call themselves the SOBs. Uh, and they really were the ones that were instrumental in saving the bridge. They worked with uh, our local legislators, with the city council to say, you know, there was value still in the bridge. It was an uh, integral part of uh, commerce between the city and, and the port. Uh, it was needed for uh, emergency response. Um, and it was still a, an icon of the city and they wanted to save it. So they, they really were the ones to, that instigated the saving of the bridge. It was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1982. Um, there were a number of features that we needed to maintain or try to replicate when we did the rehabilitation. The 100 year anniversary of the first opening was February 15th. You know, it was a historical structure, so it was nice to bring something back to operation, make it useful again. It was, uh, you know, probably a lifetime project for me. I mean, it's not often that you get to work on something that's 100 years old. So I've been working on it for three years. It's been my life for three years. So we hope with what we've done uh, on the repairs and if we continue to maintain the bridge, and uh, for the, we should be able to get another 75 to 100 years out of it. Tom, could you take me down to see the controls and see how it all works or even lift the bridge up for me? Sure, let's go down. All right. Um, could you tell us what this room is? Uh, we're up in the machinery room right now. This is sort of the guts of the, the operating equipment for the bridge. Uh, we, right behind you we have the gear frame, uh, we have uh, our main motor, 150 horsepower motor, we've got an auxiliary motor. Uh, the red items here are the brakes, both the machinery and the motor brakes. They're what, you know, when we're going down, keep us from going all the way down too fast. Okay. So, um, and then the rest of it is just the controls, the, um, the controls that tell the, the equipment what to do when we push the buttons in the, the operator's room. Right now we're in the operation room. This is where Murray Morgan wrote his book, Skid Row. And while I'm here, Tom is going to show me how to operate the bridge. Well, this is the control panel for the uh, to operate the bridge, and it's fairly easy um, to open the bridge. You go from left to right, and to close it, you go right to left. The first button you see over there turns the uh, traffic lights from green to red. Okay, it will go to red, and then the next set four sets of switches uh, lower the traffic gates and the barrier gates wait till the lights come on. Okay, now go to the next one. Okay. Do the same thing. Yep. Go to the next one. Next ones. And then we have a switch that that uh, pulls the span locks, which are bars that connect the lift span to the fixed trusses. Okay, now the bottom switch there. Yeah. To the right? Yep. Okay, and then all you do is raise the bridge. Move it to the right, you're going up. All the way to the right, the brakes are released. Oh, wow. Wow. 
wow. We'll probably go up to 40 feet. We're at like 23 right now. Okay, so those are the weights right there. Yeah, the counterweights. They're about a million pounds each. Can they take me off now? Yep. Okay, okay now do the span locks to the left. Here, these. This one? Yeah. Go to the left until it turns green. Okay. Okay, okay. hit group raise. Just push the button here. Just push okay. that. And it will automatically raise all the gates. Okay. And then when all the great Gates turn green, turn the light back to green. Okay. The uh, signal light. Okay, go ahead and hit the traffic light. Okay. To green. That's it. See? You're a bridge operator. <laughs> then I need my little pen now. <laughs> my little badge you give everyone. Again, thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed myself, enjoyed the tour. So again, thank you. It's our pleasure. Strand twists and strains the giant cables that support it. Cables of 6,300 wire strands, each 17 inches thick. Back out of the danger zone, all stricken spectators are driven to safety as the bridge gyrates like a nightmare high above the river, twisting, turning, curling. We're actually standing at a site where there have been three bridges built. The first bridge was called Galloping Gertie because it was only standing for four months before it fell apart. And that bridge opened to traffic in 1940, and it collapsed in a, about a 42 mile an hour wind just four months after that. Uh, my name is Claudia Bingham Baker, and I'm the State Department of Transportation's Olympic Region Communications Manager. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge actually failed because at the time, bridge design engineers didn't understand the importance of aerodynamics in bridge building, in suspension bridge building. The lone motorist is forced to abandon the car. He has but a few minutes in which to save himself. Face to face with fate, his destiny hanging in the balance. Will he heed the last warning or perish with the doomed structure? But he saved himself by seconds. What happened was there was a little bit of wind. The angle of the wind hitting the bridge was such that there was some vibration and oscillation that began. And it, it interacted with oscillations that the bridge was creating on its own. So the bridge literally shook itself apart. Even while the bridge was being constructed, it had an unusual amount of movement to the deck, to the point where construction workers would get seasick while they were up there working on the deck. So the engineers at the time had lots of advance warning that there was something not quite right with the bridge. And they started studying what was happening with the bridge, what was causing the movement. And um, they were just getting to the point where they were getting ready to reinforce the deck when it in fact collapsed. There was no attempt to get the debris out of the water that fell down and it's still down there now. In fact, it's eligible for the National Historic Register. But the towers were dismantled and all of the steel in the suspension cables was uh, recycled. So the day of the collapse, there were a number of cars that were crossing the bridge, both from the east side and the west side. And there are accounts minute to minute of what happened to the people that were in those cars. But the bottom line is that uh, most of the cars got off. One car did tumble into the Narrows, and unfortunately that car had a little Cocker Spaniel in it. 
uh, the, the Cocker Spaniel's name was Tubby, and Tubby was the only fatality when the bridge collapsed. No structure of steel and concrete can stand such a strain. Steel girders buckle and giant cables snap like puny threads. There it goes! Engineers are divided as to the cause of the disaster. Some claim it was the use of solid girders, others differ. But whatever the reason, Tacoma will rebuild. This time a bridge that will not provide a super thrill in the news. The replacement bridge to the 1940 bridge was the bridge over my left shoulder. That bridge was built and opened 10 years later in 1950. It would have opened a little bit earlier, but what happened in 1940 was that World War II began, and all of the nation's resources, including the steel, got diverted to the military effort. So it took a full 10 years to be able to rebuild that replacement bridge and reopen it to traffic. It was clear that there wasn't the capacity to handle the amount of traffic that we have today between the Key Peninsula and the Tacoma area. We looked at, started looking for funding to open a third bridge, or the 2007 bridge, and we were able to get permission to do that and to toll the bridge to pay for it. In 1940, there was a toll on the first bridge, the first Tacoma Narrows Bridge in 1940. There was a toll in 1950. Every time they build a bridge in Washington, there is a toll to pay for that bridge. Lucinda Broussard, Tolls Operations Manager for Washington State Department of Transportation. Anybody not using the bridge is not paying for the bridge. It's all paid for by tolls. So there's, and all the toll money stays with the bridge. So any money that's collected goes towards maintenance, insurance, uh, just to keep the equipment up. Everything is paid back to this bridge. So nothing, and the state doesn't contribute anything to the bridge. The 1950 bridge paid tolls until 1965 to pay it off. And once it was paid off, the toll was taken off. So in the past, that's how you've seen all the bridges. They build a bridge, you pay the toll, when it's paid off, it goes away. But in the future, how are you going to pay for maintenance or insurance? Could you tell me why the two bridges are made differently? Sure, that's a very good question, and it's something a lot of people have asked us. If you look at the 1950 bridge, what you see is a bridge that has historical significance. And we have a historical community that really values that. When we started looking at the design for the 2007 bridge, they explicitly asked us to not replicate the design of the 1950 bridge because they felt that would diminish its historical significance. So that was one reason why we made, made the bridges different. Another reason that, that is uh, equally significant is that the 1950 bridge towers are made out of steel. And steel now is more expensive, not only to build with, but also to maintain over the life of the bridge. So it was more economically prudent of us to build towers that were made out of concrete instead of steel. We call it Washington Green, Washington Green. Okay. and we also have a Washington Gray. Okay. Uh, those are the two colors that the State Department of Transportation tends to paint its outdoor structures. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. This is my pleasure. Take a look, Tacoma. Take a look, Tacoma. We've reached the end of our show, but Tacoma still has more stories to tell. Come back again next week for more tales from Tacoma.